Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first meeting of this committee, a unique committee that the Parliament is supporting in partnership with Young Women Lead, a leadership project that 30 young women from across Scotland are taking part in. Some are around the table today and some are in the public seating at the back. I'm really delighted to welcome both the committee members uh, and our panellists to this session. Thank you for coming along. I'd like to introduce the panel first of all. I'll put my specs on so as I can see. Professor David Kirk, who's Professor of Education at the University of Strathclyde. Do you know, you're in a different order than you are in my agenda. That's really confusing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Julie Gordon, who's tennis coach with the Judy Murray Foundation. Dr Helen Sharp, who's School of Health and Social Science at the University of Edinburgh. Danielle Gordon, who is body positivity blogger at the Chachi Power Project. Mark McGeehy, Head of Partnerships and Sustainability at Youth Scotland. And Mandy Jones, yes, uh, body positivity blogger at the Empowered Women Project. So welcome all of you. And you will be taking questions from the young women around the table today. Um, there's quite a few of you, and we are time limited. Uh, I'm hoping that this will run till approximately 12.25. Um, so don't feel you have to answer every question, please. If you feel you have something to contribute, please uh, indicate to me, and I will bring you into the discussion. There may be issues raised that fall more into the remit of some of you than others. Um, also, if there is something that you would like to add to the discussion but you don't have to hand, we can organise that later on for submission to the committee here. So, I'm also delighted to welcome those who may well be watching us online to this extremely exciting and interesting project. Agenda item number one for the committee to decide upon is to take item three in private. That would be consideration of the evidence we hear today. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. Agenda item two is the evidence session on women and girls participation in sport. The committee met in January and agreed the topic, topic of inquiry, and that is to look at the issue of access to sport, in particular as it is faced by girls and young women. And can I thank the panel for the very interesting submissions they have already made to the committee. I'd now like to open up the discussion and I would like to invite questions from the committee members rather than um, ask all of you panellists to make a presentation. Unless there's something you're desperately wishing to say before we start, I'll let you have a sentence. <laughs> no? <laughs> See, see, you've got them all intimidated already. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll move on to questions. And I would like to ask my deputy convener, Beth Clutton, to come to the first question. Thank you. And thank you to the panel for coming here today. Um, so my first question is about why do you think the proportion of girls uh, meeting physical activity guidelines is lower than boys, particularly when school activity is excluded? someone like to respond to that? Well, I'll just pick somebody if you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, followed by Helen. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to be here today. Do I need to press this? No? Can you all hear me? Yeah. yeah okay. Um, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I suppose one of the one of the things that we've learned at Youth Scotland about girls and young women's uh, participation in community-based activity is that most often it can be, um, it's not necessarily developed to meet their particular needs. It's activities that they may not necessarily want to take part in. What we did through a project called Girls on the Move, which I referred to in the submission, was turn that on its head and provide uh, support through small amounts of funding to help girls identify what they wanted to take part in. So rather than, as all too often is the case, where in a previous role I would talk to people and say, well, we need to get um, girls doing rugby, we need to get girls doing football because there's a governing body target around that or something like that, actually saying, well, have you spoke to girls in the community and do they want to do that or do they want to do something else? Um, so the 
one of the things that we found in our recent projects um, we delivered with uh, Sports Scotland on Active Girls was if you look at um, school participation, um, the, the, the diff, the, one, of the, one of the issues is that the, in school you, you know people um, and you know the people who will be delivering it, the PE teacher or so on, whether it is out in the community, if you have to go to a club where you don't know anyone, whether you're a boy or girl of any age, then that creates a barrier, that creates a fear. Whereas if you have um, community club people coming into the school to support the delivery, then all of a sudden you've created a, a human connection. There's a relationship there with that coach, that young leader, that you can then help facilitate to go into the community. But that, that's not the common way of doing things. So that may be one of the issues from our experience. Helen. Uh, yeah, I think I totally agree, Mark, with lots of the points that you're raising. I think um, my background is in psychology, so I work in body image and eating disorders. And for me, it's really interesting developmentally that the time that we see this gender difference emerging is in kind of early adolescence, so 11, 12, 13. We see this, this big kind of uh, disparity emerging, and that is also paralleled with other types of disparities that we see emerging at that time. So for me in particular, the interesting one is body dissatisfaction and, and, and low body confidence. So we basically see these things kind of happening in parallel, um, and we know that developmentally this is a time when young women are going through quite major physical changes, also quite major psychological changes in terms of identity development and also social comparisons and looking to peers. And that these are all sorts of things that I can see feed into um, why particular types of activity or engagements and particular types of sports might be, might be preferable. And that's where actually, as Mark says, speaking with young people about what it is that they want to do rather than make an assumption about what they, what they should be doing is really important. I have uh, David, followed by Mandy. Um, so I think part of the answer to your question, Beth, is that um, it's complex. Um, and, and for many years, and, and this is an issue that's been, in, in my field in physical education, has been running for maybe 30 years or more, at least. Um, um, and I think that the initial um, and recurrent sort of answer to your problem is, uh, to your question is that the girls are a problem. It's the girls themselves. It's almost like a blaming the victim situation. But I think the research that's been done in that intervening period of time over the last 30 or 40 years, particularly by feminist researchers, has shown that this is a very complex issue indeed. It is to do with where girls are at this particular stage in their lives. It's to do with treating them with respect. It's to do with taking them seriously. All too often in school physical education, um, they, they aren't actually taken that seriously. And certainly what they feel is important for them isn't considered as part of the curriculum offer. Thank you. Mandy. Something that we were just uh, thanks for the opportunity, um, everyone, for having me today. Um, just a wee discussion we were having before we came in there was that there is a lack of sort of female coaches and female leaders in certain sports. And I think that for young women, particularly when I was in school, if you don't see yourself in a role, then you don't see it as being possible and you're probably um, a bit of lack of engagement. So I went on to become a, a bodybuilder in my early to, to mid twenties, but I hadn't seen a woman do that until my adult years. So how would I have known that maybe there was an interest in that sport? I don't know, I think that there's a big lack of kind of female instructors and leaders um, in a lot of areas and whether that's that we need to kind of coach leaders from a younger age or, 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 or something I'm not quite sure. Thank you. Um, I'm going to bring Nell in because the question that Nell uh, has ties in with this and then perhaps come back to both of you for a response. Nell. Hello. Um, my question is why do you think physical activity declines with age and is there a particular drop off between secondary and primary, and why do you think that is? Julie. Um, hi there, thanks for having me. Um, just to, to add to what Danny was uh, saying as well, it was like, I think there is that lack of role models in sports. So when, when children, girls are younger in primary school, they, they have female teachers and um, maybe older girls they see doing sport, but the older they get, the less role models and leaders that are out there. 
Um, certainly as a female coach, I've worked in tennis for over 20 years and um, I have very few female colleagues and um, there's an initiative like that Judy Murray's kind of pushed through something called She Rallies and it's all about um, getting mums, teachers, older girls, sports leaders, training them to deliver so that young, young girls and teenage girls can have female role models who will lead sessions. And I, think, I, think, I think there needs to be a commitment to kind of leadership um, in teenage girls and you know, females in their 20s and above. And if, you, if, you, if there's more of a female workforce that's, that's developed, then uh, I think you'll see more girls playing sport. I think the lack of that is, is why a lot, of, a lot of girls fall out as they go into kind of high school and beyond. Danielle. Um, there's been proof that um, the biggest drop-offs are between the ages of about 13 to 15 years old for girls. And I think that directly relates to puberty and the self-esteem issues that come along with puberty and the changes in bodies at that age, that uh, girls are not necessarily supported enough with. Um, the, the teaching in school about how natural those changes are and the issues that could come along with it, along with breast size, periods, body hair, um, that might all be subjects for bullying or, um, or problems to arise. Um, and potentially the addition of being more, having a more active uh, online life at those ages, uh, interaction with social media, the comparison sort of culture that comes along with that um, if you're not using social media in, in, in a positive, positive way. Um, I think those are, those are big issues for that age group. I'm going to bring uh, David and Mandy back in, but can I ask Beth and Nell if there's anything you would like to probe further from what you've heard? Um, just briefly, just um, there seemed to be a relationship between what you were saying, Mark, and what you were saying, David, about um, the basically women or young girls not being respected in what they actually want to be doing. And why do you think that is? Like, why are girls' considerations not being put into place? Nell? No, that's fine. Thank you. I know that come in on something. Um, it's following on from your focus on um, online life and social media. Um, do you have any specific examples of, say, for influences um, that social media have on young women and girls' perception of fitness ideals? Uh, oh, sorry. Go to David and Mandy. Um, I don't have research, I'm not an academic, but I have anecdotal research. And, and um, you know, I think the way our culture is at the moment is very screwed up about our ideas of what, of what fitness actually is, what, what health is and what, um, what, what sporting activity is for. We have kind of lost our idea that sport is good for our physical and our mental health and has many many variations, many, many benefits on top of just, um, many, many benefits on top of just mental and physical sport. You know, it's, there's been proof about how, you know, we, it can aid people as they grow up with their team skills, with their determination, with their leadership ability. Um, and the way that fitness is, is now talked about is all to do with uh, how to change your body shape how to have a particular body shape. Um, and it's very apparent, like e even me, just from a personal experience, um, looking at my social media, which I would probably say is one of the most curated social media accounts that there is, because I have made sure that that is what I'm feeding my brain with every single day rather than uh, any toxic messaging. And even, even still, the algorithm still shows me when I look at my fitness tab on Instagram is a thin, extremely toned um, bodies where fitness is not anything to do with physical and mental well-being. It is about having a certain body type. And I think that message that is constantly being pushed to young girls is warping is warping our idea of why we should, like the motivations of why we should be having, be undertaking physical activity. Mm, David. 
So there's three things really now uh, because of the multiple questions, but why girls aren't respected? Um, I think we need to think about uh, when, when girls arrive in secondary school, physical education, um, and boys. Um, these are large classes, 30 pupils, maybe more, of widely varying interest and motivation and ability. And teachers are faced with um, dealing with that on a day-to-day -day basis, period by period, through the school day. Um, and so, it, and, and the way that school physical education is set up around what we call the multi-activity curriculum, short units of work around basketball, then soccer, then hockey, then gymnastics, and so on. It's a particular structure to school physical education, even within the context of curriculum for excellence, that, that works against student-centred pedagogies. So, so that's in a sense, the, the, the answer to the first question. What I was going to say, um, to add to the mix on this, in terms of why girls maybe drop out um, or drop activity drops down, it's a curious thing about the way that community sports are organised. So in my lifetime, um, my first ever experience of uh, organised teaching and physical activity sport was when I went to high school, um, age 12. Um, but in that period leading up till now, we've had an explosion in youth sport um, provision for young people. And we now find kids as young as four or five involved with all sorts of different sports in the community. And it seems as if anybody is allowed to play until they get to the age of about 12 or 13. Then all of a sudden, it becomes very, very exclusive. I know this firsthand because I, I was a rugby coach in, in, in youth teams for, for many years with my sons. Um, all of a sudden, you may be desperate to play, you turn up to every training session, but you're not allowed to play because the team's got to win and you're not good enough. So we actually have a policy, an unwritten policy, in the way that community-based sport operates. You can be as keen as mustard to play. And it, it works between the ages of 13 and 16 or 17. And then it stops again. This is a remarkable thing. And you can be the biggest duffer there is and be offered a game because they're short in numbers. So my eldest son, who I coached all, all the way through his youth um, set up in rugby, is now 28 and plays for the probably the worst team on the earth. Um, and anybody can play again. So, so there's something structural around, um, around the way we do youth sport that I think is, a, is an issue, it's not, it, with, along with all of the other issues that we've that been mentioned. Final thing about social media, um, there's been a fantastic, uh, very innovative project carried out by um, a young researcher called Dr. Victoria Goodyear at Birmingham University, where she's studied young people's um, use of social media to access information about health and wellbeing. And it has, has come up with some very, very fascinating and scary um, results. Mandy, could you sort of wrap up this part of the session for yeah. us? Yes, um, I've sort of been eagerly nodding along to a lot of those points there. I've got so much that I want to add. Um, again, I'm not an academic, so I come from a purely sort of anecdotal social media type of um, research. However, interestingly, a lot of my audience online is now that sort of um, 15, 16, 17 age group. So I've got a few things um, that I'd like to add. So first of all, with regards to the dropout in that sort of age group between like 13 to 15 and 16, a lot of the things that came up in the research that sort of the stuff that I received was that mixed classes are troubling as their bodies change. And to echo what Danny was saying, I just don't think there's enough uh, sort of preparation for how the body's going to change or how that ties into their kind of fitting in with uh, physical activity. But I'd also like to add um, that on social media, I feel like, again, like Danny was saying, there's this lack of engagement with fitness and for what it really offers other than the physical aesthetic kind of thing that comes with it, this cartoon-like image we're being fed. And recently, we actually received a letter from a girl who's 16 and she just wanted to write anonymously to us about her own body image struggles. And there were so many things in there. A lot of what she'd been fed was from social media. 
She wanted to replicate some of the celebrity um, imagery that she saw online. She says she wears a, a waist trainer to school to try and bring her waist in. She can't wait till she's of an age where she can um, have her body operated on and she can have cosmetic surgery. So actually, what fitness is and how that sort of aesthetic being a byproduct of fitness is something that's overlooked completely. Um, I hope that that makes a bit of sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move on now to uh, Diane and Katie. Uh, Diane. Um, I've got a question which I think leads on quite nicely from what David was saying. Um, why do you think that male adherence to physical activity is highest among 16 to 24 year olds, but for women it's highest among 35 to 44 year olds? Uh, I'm thinking perhaps I'll bring in Katie as well, because I think both of the topics you wanted to cover relate very much to what David was saying. Yeah. Oh. So my question is really around um, female participation in sports clubs. Um, I think you touched on that. It's, there's a bit of elitism maybe in sports clubs and especially across different ages. And as we get towards a more affiliated sports club with actual sporting bodies, there's a real drop for women's participation. So I was just wondering what you thought about that. Yeah, so two things, David, if you could address them. I'll try and juggle them. Um, <laughs> on them. No, 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 no thank you're you. right. Um, so, so I think that you, the first question, I think that the, the, the issue about uh, age stage is very, very important. Um, you know, if you think about the transition from primary to secondary school for a start, and you've all been through that, um, moving from a small, quite intimate sort of setting usually into a much scarier, you know, big school. Um, Young people who have a, an ongoing involvement in community-based sport, that transition may be easier for them in terms of their physical activity. But then, as, as I say, you come up against this, and it might not be in every sport. Mark will have much better insight to this than me. I'm speaking very much from my personal experience. But certainly, you get to some sports where it's ex you're excluded. You know, um, then if you think about the transition from school to work, school to university, um, you think about the transition into early adulthood, maybe into steady relationship, marriage, or some partnership, and so there's all sorts of crucial stages that that disrupt your ability to remain physically active. And I'm not sure how well physical education at school, for example, prepares young people for those adaptations that they need to make in in uh, certainly young adulthood. Um, I think that uh, uh, Mandy's uh, comment when we were chatting earlier about um, not being aware of the range of possibilities is another thing that, that we find with, uh, with kids. You know, they know about hockey, they know about netball, they know about swimming, but they don't know about spin, they don't know about boxer size, and it's only when those possibilities are opened up to them that, that then the range becomes uh, much, much clearer. Um, I don't know if does that also tie in your question as well? Does that give you some...? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think really the it's why the participation is so much less for girls than it is for boys, and I think maybe some of those issues that you're talking about tend to affect women a lot more. There, there are issues around masculinities and femininities as well, and, and, and st girls are often sent the message that it's not... Girly girls can't play sport. You know, you, and, and this is actually a very real issue in some communities. And again, we need to be quite contextualised about this. Um, my colleague Kim Oliver, who, who works in um, Las Cruces, New Mexico, tells horrendous stories about Hispanic American girls who, who didn't be sporty because it, it, it puts them at serious risk of violence in their cultures. Now, that's an extreme example, but. We can think of um, maybe similar sorts of situations in Scotland and in the UK where that is an important issue. Yeah, I'm going to move on to, to Mark and then Danielle, but I would be interested in Julie's experience about the 16 to 24 year old males where it's older women that tend to come back to sport and your, your view on that. Um, I think, I mean, in terms of the kind of 16 to 24 age group, I think that where where we've had success there, it's maybe when we, in terms of from my experiences of being a tennis coach, is when you've kept girls together in groups throughout the teenage years. Um, 
I agree with David about the kind of youth sport environment where actually yeah, you get to a certain age, if you're not good enough to compete in the competitive structure, you kind of sent the message that, that you know this sport's not for you anymore. So I do think we need more kind of recreational opportunities for 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 girls and boys um, in their teenage years, and and I, I think also that you need to have a social aspect to it as well, and, and to sell that you know whether it's you know come and play and we have a pizza at the end or um, you know br bring a friend or you, they can do the scores even if they can't play something like that. I think I think it needs to be kind of more than just about the sport you know to keep people engaged. Um, in terms of women coming back into it, you know it's maybe like. Maybe, you know, in terms of having children and kind of life transitions, they might re-engage through their children. So um, I've seen that a lot, kind of anecdotally, that you know mothers and, and fathers bring their children uh, to to take part in in tennis, and then they want to get involved themselves. And I think I think engaging parents um, and with their children is a key way of re-engaging, maybe particularly mothers. And um, certainly, uh, there's quite a lot of push on kind of parent and child sessions in the kind of tennis world. You know, we, we, we kind of believe in that. Uh, and it gets, you know, parents, you know, exercising with their children. Um, there's another thing, a junior park run. I don't know if you're aware of it. But uh, again, one of the beauties of that is it re-engages adults in, in running. Um, so I think there's some park run fans there. <laughs> um, but uh, th 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 that is for four to 14-year-olds. But parents end up taking part with the children. So it's a very clever way of re-engaging adults in, in physical activity. Um, and it's very kind of inclusive, so any, any level can do it. Um, yeah, thank you. <clears throat> Mark, the evidence is quite clear about uh, sports clubs and participation, if you could yeah, address I, that. I was actually going to say something along those lines there. Um, I suppose one of the, one of the issues um, in terms of the sport is only successful in Scotland on a community level because of the volunteers that deliver it. If you remove the volunteers involved in sport, then we wouldn't have a sporting infrastructure. Uh, but the, if you look at the majority of those volunteers, their entry into sport has been a very positive one. They've went through, they might have had a competitive aspect to it, they've, they've developed. And I say that having found a sport that wasn't a traditional one, I ended up doing martial arts and I ended up having a little bit of success in it. Um, but then, those are the people who end up leading and who end up delivering and volunteering and they need to be celebrated because they're giving up their time and that's brilliant, but they won't necessarily have had the, the experience of um, that sort of person-centered approach. And, you know, they love sport um, and so you've come along, so therefore you will like sport as well. Whereas what we talk about in, in youth work is that youth work approach is that person-centered, that relationship you get alongside someone. So actually the sport is the tool for the engagement. And that's a very different ap approach and a very different way of delivering sport. Um, so one of the examples I would, I would like to give is I was involved in a, an initiative um, in the East End of Glasgow uh, looking at a Commonwealth Games legacy project. Um, and that was working with communities in the East End which had identified that there were opportunities for young people to do um, competitive sport, that sort of sports development pathway. Um, or taste or come and try in that sort of youth work setting. But there was very few opportunities for that ongoing, regular recreational involvement, whereby if you were rubbish, you could still come along and have fun with your friends. That didn't exist. Um, and I don't think that's unique to that area of Glasgow. I think that's probably something that people will experience all across the country. Um, the difficulty is... That, that infrastructure around the, the volunteers' knowledge, bringing it back to that, if you want to involve young people who aren't necessarily sporty, but <coughs> then you have to make it, you have to break down the steps. You have to get alongside them and start from where they are. So that's what we mean by a youth work approach. We're involved in um, some work uh, with a new project um, delivering um, in two sites in, in North and West Glasgow, um, which is talking about sport for change, where it's, sport is just the tool to engage um, people from disadvantaged backgrounds. And the, there's commonalities, whether that's girls' involvement or ethnic minorities or um, other people who have experienced disadvantage. So it's, it's you know, David said earlier, it's very complex because sport won't exist without the volunteers, but the vo those volunteers won't necessarily have the, the skills to engage people that aren't traditionally sporty. So how do we, how do we bring these th two things together? Danielle. I just wanted to reflect on the fact that 
women tend to come back into sport in their mid-30s, and the, <laughs> there's so many stories that I had from women saying, oh, I'm only getting back into it now after such a harrowing experience at school. I was put off. It was put off so badly because of, you know, an issue of getting my period one time and it being so embarrassing, or the uniforms were just horrendous and I was put off sport completely, or I was always being told that I was a boy or that I was gay, which was such a negative, you know, um, you know when, when, you know, I'm 36 now, so it would be my age and then I know what, they, what they're talking about. Um, and I think that women tend to come back into sport at an older age because there's a community feel that might encourage them, um, because there's different motivations behind why they want to get back into sport. There's an idea around fitness, but, there's, but then you also have to remember about the ideas around diet culture and pressures on women to have a specific body type as they age. So not all motivations are, um, are, are the best motivations. <clears throat> I think, is, is it pressing, David? One very quick point, just to add as well, that there's a, there is, in the research, there's a social gradient in participation amongst older people and amongst women. And it's certainly the case, all of the evidence shows that older uh, women in the 30s, 40s and older who, um, uh, don't, uh, who are in, in living in poverty, living in, in multiple deprivation, do not come back into sport have never been in sport and have no opportunities to do so. And, and one of the things that concerns me about a lot of our um, initiatives is that they're not very well targeted. They're very general, where I think they really need to go where the need is. And the need would certainly be for older people, older adults, would be in those multiply deprived parts of Scotland. Right. I think the next theme of questions that we have ties in very well with, with what we've already had. So can I ask um, Jenny and Lauren, um, particular interests in this, uh, to start us off in that section. Jenny. Hi. Um, we've kind of touched on this briefly already um, in regards to social media, but um, could we explore maybe a bit further the role of body image as a barrier to participation, um, in particular the factors that are unique to young girls um, and what can, uh, can be done to change that culture. Lauren, I think you can add to that for the panel. Yeah, hello. Um, so again, this question's been touched on slightly before, but um, we're looking for examples of how negative experiences of PE at school um, among girls can act as a barrier to participation. Helen? Yeah, I can maybe pick up on the social media point. So um, I'm coming from a kind of slightly different background as a, uh, an academic, um, but there is a large body of research now looking at different types of images on social media. So um, kind of about sort of five years ago, everybody was interested in looking at thinspo, thinspiration, um, so kind of images that glorify thinness, and that kind of tied in with the current physical kind of ideal for women of, of thinness um, and there's an extremely large body of um, research evidence showing looking at those types of images is, is, is really detrimental to young women's um, body image. Then kind of a couple of years ago we had a bit of a shift culturally um, and it's reflected in what we've talked about so far where we moved more to a kind of fit ideal so here, the ideal is rather than just a focus on thinness, it's a focus on leanness. Um, and there was a kind of thought within the body image and eating disorders community that maybe this might be a more, could be a more positive ideal. Um, what we've actually seen is that um, really we've just replaced one unhelpful ideal with another. Um, and the small body of research evidence that's been put together to date around fitspo, so kind of fitspiration imagery, is that it has exactly the same negative impact as we saw with the thinspo imagery. Um, you see that, there, that people who are exposed to that kind of imagery do have 
higher intentions to exercise, um, but those are never translated into actual activity levels, and they're associated with increases in, in body dissatisfaction and, and body shame and more kind of body surveillance. So really, it actually, although it looks like it might be promising and might promote engagement with activity and sport, it really, it really doesn't, and kind of builds an ongoing... Um, ideal of a uh, kind of unattainable physique, which is just a, a kind of a barrier for young people accessing. So I just thought I'd, I'd kind of add that, that actually the, the research evidence really aligns well with people's anecdotal experience on, on social media. Chris, your question was of particular interest on that theme, if you'd like to add it into the mix before I go to, to others. So I kind of snuck the question in earlier, but um, now that it's, it's back to social media, uh, I think that um, what I want to ask is, why do you think that has this change happened from Thinspiration to Fitspiration as you've defined it? They still remain that kind of same kind of controlling mechanism. Why do you think that this kind of continues to occur regardless of the change in direction? Would you like to come back on that, Helen, before I move to David and Mandy? Uh, yeah, I can do. Um, so I think, I mean, an interesting area that we haven't really touched on at all but is, is relevant here is that both both Fins, Thinspiration and um, Fitspiration really are buying into a much broader um, uh, kind of issue around weight bias and, and fat phobia. Um, so they both perpetuate a kind of um, a message around weight that being at a higher weight status is a kind of morally bad state, that you've put yourself in it, um, and that actually your weight is something that should be under your individual physical control. Um, and the large body of research evidence shows that that's, that's not the case, um, and that the social and the kind of wider determinants of, of health are incredibly important from that. Um, but the, the implication of that kind of um, uh, weight bias that is incredibly prevalent in, in society um, is that um, we should all be working on ourselves physically. Um, and so whether that gets expressed through working on ourselves by restriction, so dietary restriction, or expressed by working on ourselves through exercise, it's really the same, same message that's coming through. So I think that that is why they have the same underlying kind of negative um, impact. Chris, you want to come back on that? I suppose to follow on from that, um, one of the things that we discovered while researching this was um, way back when we were um, originally starting this was that um, in relation to, say, for example, fat phobia and weight control, um, eating disorders as a as a um, as an issue as an illness was had very high. Um, I think it was 1.25 million people were suffering from it, and yet the funding was incredibly low in in response to that. Do you feel that this moralistic idea that this should be in your control kind of feeds into that? kind of aspect of the reason why society in general doesn't maybe consider treating this as seriously as it should be? Thank you, Chris. Would you like to address that, Helen, and then we'll move on? Uh, yeah, so um, as I've understood the question, it's around why eating disorders don't get the recognition that we would anticipate based on, first of all, how serious they are and also how common they are. Yeah, I think it is... Um, that the idea that you should have your own individual control over your body and that it's a kind of moral decision for you about what you do and don't eat um, is really important in that aspect. I mean, the other really interesting thing in the context of weight bias in eating disorders is actually when we think of eating disorders, we typically think of severe and enduring anorexia. Um, Whereas actually the most common eating disorders are eating disorders associated with loss of control over eating, like binge eating, um, which tend to be experienced by people who are at a higher weight. Um, so even there we can see that actually that group are kind of overlooked as having experienced a, a very serious uh, difficulty that they need mental health support with. Um, and it's viewed you know, often by people as just an, uh, um, an inability to have self-control. David, body image is a barrier. Body image, and then the the, the issue of um, of um, young people, uh, girls' experiences in physical education, and um, 
so very briefly, body shape anxiety, as we understand it, is so widespread uh, in, in society and has been for quite some time. I can just make one comment, and, and we were talking about this earlier before we came in, and it's the re repeated use of body mass index as a measure of uh, obesity. Obesity scientists have a huge responsibility to bear here, as do GPs. Um, so this is so widely used, it's such a crude measure. Uh, mostly it would, the, the Scottish men's rugby team who will play tomorrow against France, most of those people would be classified as obese, clinically obese, according to BMI. Um, so the, the widespread use of this does not help at all. And we really need to have some critical scrutiny of how it's used and, and what it means. There's conceptual confusion around weight and obesity. These are different things. Um, so that's just to say that, and, and it doesn't help with the body shape anxiety issue. In school physical education, one of the things we found from the project we did in Glasgow schools that we provided written evidence on, the girls said this all the time. They were just terrified of being judged, and that was the language they used. Being judged in, by other girls, uh, because we were working with all girls' classes. The stories they told us about boys were just, some of them were just horrendous. I mean, really would verge on um, abuse. Um, but being judged and being so self-conscious, so there's something about school physical education, about being in specific kind of uniform or kit, your body being exposed as you're learning new movements, the potential for humiliation, and therefore the need for a particular kind of pedagogy in physical education classes that helps girls to feel comfortable, to trust each other, so they talked a lot about trust, um, the um, learning to work together um, with, with other girls who are not your friends, girls who you don't know very well. Um, th that never gets worked on in school physical education. Um, <clears throat> and being, being taken seriously, I mentioned this before. Actually being asked for your opinions on things, sharing information about what you think your needs are, what your interests are. Um, so these are some of the reasons why girls find school physical education difficult. Um, even the fact that they're incredibly intimidated, some girls, by other girls who are the sporty girls and the loud girls and the girls who attract the teacher's attention all the time. Thank you. I'm going to go to Mandy and Danielle because of their direct experience that they have with this. But I think the, the question that Sheikha was talking about earlier is very relevant here. If you could feed that in before Mandy and Danielle address it. I think you've touched up on curriculum for excellence earlier, and I just wondered um, what can be done to improve a girl's experience of PE in general, like within the context of education itself? Thank you. Um, there's a few things I'd like to add just on what we were talking about there, and then I'm going to go on to your question there. So um, it was interesting what Helen was saying about the shift from thinspiration to fitspiration look it sells. Social media provides direct access to brands, uh, for brands to certain celebrities and influencers. Kim Kardashian, for example, has 80 million followers. That is 80 million impressionable sets of eyes who watch everything she does, who want to look the way she does. There's no getting away from that fact. And most of those will be between a certain age group. Um, we've also got this surge, something that cropped up a lot, we've got this surge in reality TV programmes which serve us a new beauty ideal, which is that sort of cartoon-like figure. Um, and it's no coincidence, I don't think, that I read an article in The Guardian the other day that hospital admissions for eating disorders are at an all-time high. And like Helen was saying, the eating disorders don't always show visually, so it might be that we're not kind of um, accounting for everything there. Um, and another barrier to body um, for body image is that um, they don't like, okay, so don't like being forced to wear a uniform came up a lot. So that is, uh, you know, s something that they, they all have to wear. Maybe they have, feel they have shorter legs or they don't like just different things. You're going through so much change at that time um, and it can be very difficult. And what was your question again? <laughs> I went off on a social media Kardashian tangent. No, I think it was in relation to what David was saying yeah. earlier uh, with curriculum for excellence, but... Uh, to be exact, my question was, what can be done to improve a girl's experience of PE itself? Uh, I, well, I think there are just, yeah, a few different things cropped up. So a lot of girls said that they didn't like being in mixed classes um, because, again, that allows for that sort of harassment and, you know, jeering and whatever from the boys. 
um, and a lot of girls didn't like wearing uniform. And again, just a lack of awareness of how their bodies are going to change and how that's going to affect um, their confidence and self-esteem as they change, as their bodies change, um, periods as well. Um, yeah, there's a lot in there. Danielle. Um, a, few, a few things I've written down. Um, in regards to the inspiration, fitspiration, weight bias, um, I, I feel like that's also tied in with in, international beauty standards or standardised beauty standards that um, are constantly are constantly being moved further and further out of out of everybody's reach, and that's that's tied to capitalism, that's tied to brands, that's tied to advertising media. Um, so it's it it's just an it's just that, that I feel like that will potentially never never end. There will be another thing and another thing and another thing that will keep on going until um, I, I say until, but I, I don't know when there's an end to it. But it will just keep developing until uh, you know we 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 we, are, we abolish capitalism. Um, <laughs> um, That's a bit beyond the reach of this committee. <laughs> Come on, Linda. Um, <laughs> um, in regards to girls specifically and their barriers in sport, I've written down um, the changes that happen with puberty and in specifics, um, breasts, breast size, breast growth, um, or, or, or comparisons of breast sizes, um, the the idea that parents have no no clue that they should be providing supportive clothing for their children, um, the the bullying and the sort of uh, ribbing that comes with 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 the, with these extremely natural changes in bodies, and that's to do with 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 body hair as well and and with periods and for it. To, you know, I, I'm of a, of a certain generation where there was so much shame and lack of conversation in schools around periods, around, like, it was, you know, you know, girls were still taught about periods separate from the boys. Um, and I, I know that's probably very different now in schools, and I hope it is. But there's lack, there, there's still so much shame wrapped up in the things that girls experience as they go through puberty that that can cause them to uh, tease other other girls or be teased by boys or or be sexualized by boys um, and i've had actually quite upsetting uh, evidence of being sexualized by older men and teachers um, which have come to me and which i have submitted anonymously but it's it it's it's also another aspect that affects young girls that might not affect other genders. Uh, Helen and then David, please. Yeah, just very briefly to follow up on, on Danny's point, there was a study over in um, Australia looking specifically at the um, question of breast development as a barrier to um, engaging in PE and um, I think they were quite surprised to find that it was a, a rate of 40% of girls in secondary school rated breast development as a, as a specific barrier to them and that the issues that they were raising were around um, concerns about breast movement during um, physical activity, pain um, from breast movement during physical activity and not having the right not knowing what type of sports bra they should be wearing and how to access it. So, yeah, just again to, to back it up, that that is definitely something that we know from research is a, is a barrier. Right, before I bring uh, David in, Jenny. Um, I think you spoke briefly about it there, Danielle, but um, I was just wondering in regards to body image, um, looking a bit closer at fashion, the kind of unique fashion trends um, for young women and how that could potentially be a barrier um, to their particip uh, participation in sport. I think we'll stick with Danielle in that one, David, and then come back to you. <laughs> um, I've spoken to a few PE teachers, actually, over the last couple of weeks to discuss this because um, my experience of, of, of sport when I was at school was I went to a private school in Glasgow and we had a very strict uniform and it was the most off-putting thing ever um, because of very small skimpy shorts feeling very uncomfortable feeling very um insecure um 
and not having any variation in that. Um, something that, um, a few points around that is some schools, when they don't have a uniform, a sporting uniform, uh, and you're allowed to, there's been positives because you're allowed to choose what you wear and you get more opportunity to, um, to decide and uh, cover up or, uh, or not cover up however you want to, which is great. And that, but on the flip side of that, it's potentially causing more problems because there's um, pressure on people to have certain clothing, certain brands, uh, certain styles, which they might not have access to. There could be bullying involved with that. Um, and then when there is a sort of school uniform or sporting uniform that is brought in a negative and a positive on that uh, on that aspect is it can be really restrictive and um, no two girls are the same so there's always going to be a comparison that is provided when you're in a standardized uniform uh, that, and it might not just it just might not be suitable for the person or the sporting activity and uh, and but I have spoken to someone from a school in Edinburgh who says that they're, which was a delight for me to hear because they are a private school, but they have a standardized school uniform, sporting uniform, and but it's really varied. So they have many, many different options from cycling shorts to shorts, to short shorts, to, uh, to skirts, to a skirt, which I didn't even know what that was, but it's a skirt with shorts attached to it, uh, to hoodies, to joggers, to, and I was like, that's amazing to hear because you know, it wasn't like that when I was at school, there was no option. And that was definitely off-putting for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, so there seems to be like issues when there is a uniform, when there's not a uniform. Um, but yeah, fashion, I suppose, does play a massive part if, 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 you, if you don't have a uniform that you have to adhere to. Right, I'm, I'm going to ask Anna to add to the discussion about barriers to sport um, and then go to David and perhaps Ellen again. Anna. Uh, yes, thank you so much uh, for all the evidence that you've been given already. Um, I'm wondering how these barriers that we've discussed so far uh, might affect participation uh, in sports in adult life, and do you think to to which extent do they still pose a problem? David. Um, I was going to respond uh, to Sheikha's uh, question specifically, first of all, and then maybe add something on, on Anna's question. Um, so Curriculum for Excellence, um, when you talk to teachers in schools, they sometimes grumble about Curriculum for Excellence because it, it forces them to do certain things. But actually, it's a very, very robust uh, conceptual framework that gives individual schools lots of freedom to do things that best suit the pupils who attend that school. And I don't think physical education teachers always take advantage of that fact, or perhaps they're even aware of it. Um, so that's the first thing to say, is, is curriculum for excellence is not a problem for innovating in school physical education. Um, <clears throat> I think that in terms of how we improve physical education, my work with teachers suggests to me that many female teachers in particular are very aware that what they offer girls isn't meeting their needs. Some teachers will say to you, we don't have a problem in our school. And I probe and say, well, what do you mean? And they say, well, our girls, the Americans would say, the girls turn up and turn out. They turn up, they come to class, and they turn out, they wear their kit, and they appear to be uh, engaged. But we have a concept in physical education research where we talk about competent bystanders. These are kids who look as if they're busy and engaged. They're always in the line to do something. And when the teacher looks around again, they never see them do it. They actually are back in the line again, and they think, oh, well, yeah, they must be participating. Um, what we really need are not one-off projects that have got a limited lifespan, however clever they might be, however innov innovative they might be. What we need is to mainstream pedagogies that work for girls. The best example I can give you is the, the stuff we provided in the written evidence based on the activist work. It's targeted specifically, though, for girls who are um, largely living in multiple deprivation. Um, whether this would work for boys, people keep asking us, what about the boys? And we say, oh, well, yeah, the boys are doing okay, but yes, maybe it could work for them as well. What about the kids in the affluent schools? Well, maybe it could work for them too, but the need for us, we see it primarily in those areas 
of multiple deprivation. The main reason why, the one thing we do know from research, it's not that physical activity participation in youth predicts participation in adulthood. It's physical inactivity that predicts activity in adulthood. If you think about the consequences of that, or the implications of that idea, if, if young people are inactive in their youth, there's a very high possibility they will be inactive adults as well. That's why it's so important that school physical education works, because it's, it's available to all children and it's free at the point of delivery. Yeah, well, we've moved on to the sort of wider societal issues there, which is good, because I know that Reagan and Katie want to both probe that. Reagan. Um, my question is, to what extent do traditional gender roles act as a barrier to sports participation and physical activity in, among young women? Katie, I think both questions tie in. Just, um, based off that, there are a lot of damaging ideas. Of Kate, start again. Your mic oh, yeah. didn't come on. <laughs> um, just based on that, there are a lot of damaging ideals around what it means to be a woman and feminine characteristics. And how do you think that that impacts sport and what can we do to rectify that? Helen? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> gosh, big topic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, might, I might leave the how can we rectify bit now. Um, so I think one thing that's uh, one kind of theoretical model that might be helpful to talk about at this point is a theory called objectification theory. So basically the idea there is that women's bodies historically have been presented as being passive and as being objects to be looked at, to be worked upon. Um, and one of the interesting things in the context of sport is that when... Um, women um, internalise these gender ideals, so this kind of objectified gender ideal, it, what they tend to do is do a process of self-surveillance, so basically watching and looking and checking for them, you know, at themselves, and that we know that that process is extremely strongly linked with experience of shame around the body, um, and then also with body dissatisfaction and all the things we've talked about flow from that. So I think one of the interesting things about that theory is that it might help us to think a bit about what sorts of sports environments might be and exercise environments might be helpful and what sorts of environments might be more difficult. So we know environments like, for example, a kind of traditional gym environment um, are actually environments where those sorts of experiences, so that self-surveillance, are much more common. Um, and there are other types of environments which don't bring about those, those sorts of experiences. Um, so that aspect of gender roles, it's just kind of one element, I think is very, very relevant here in the context of thinking about when people engage in sport. Danielle. Um, one of the points that I made in my evidence is, is, is based on... Um, well, I didn't know about objectification theory, like the wording <laughs> around it, but, um, you know, the idea that women are supposed to be small, they're supposed to be cute, presentable, attractive, uh, feminine, and then sport is considered to be masculine or butch. Um, those are, those have, from what people have messaged me about, have had a massive impact on... Uh, people's interactions. Um, the the idea of have of being of of the self surveillance. Um, I spoke to one teacher who took a very active role in discussing what her students needed and what they would prefer, and they found that um, during swimming, swimming was one of the the most difficult because you are so exposed, um, and she said there was a huge, huge drop off, um, you know, of, of people participating in swimming in swimming classes. And so she said, well, what can we do? And it was actually because there was a lot of being outside of the pool and waiting to, for your turn to be in the pool. And they said we would rather the, the idea that they're, that they're being watched or the, 
even if they're not being watched, they think they might be being watched. Um, and, and the fear that comes along with that. So what she, what she implemented was actually everyone being in the pool at the same time. So doing synchronized swimming, doing water polo, and doing uh, life life saving activities. So just to help them feel like they weren't uh, exposed more than they needed to be. Um, which you know is a nice sort of. I feel that's a nice plaster over. The, the underlying issue of, of, of these girls having such self-confidence issues. Um, so, but just having that dialogue, which I know that um, David has uh, advocates for, is having that conversation with the students constantly of what, what can we do to make it better, I think is so important. Katie, you wanted to come back in before I go yes. to David, <clears throat> Mark and Mandy, and Reagan, you too, if you wish. Katie. Um, my, I actually had a question specifically for Julie. Um, tennis is often held up as quite a good example of there's a lot of good female role models, but this idea of femininity is something which Serena Williams, is one of the biggest female role models, is often dragged down for. Do you see an impact in that in young girls that you coach? Can you, can you repeat that? Sorry, just about Serena. Yeah. Particularly, sorry. Um, <laughs> The, that Serena Williams has often um, said that her body is masculine, um, her female characteristics are often um, essentially stripped from her. Um, I just wondered the impact that had on any young girls who had an interest in the sport and could see a female role model who was being masculine, masculinised. Um, yeah, I think uh, this, this might sound a bit strange, but the boys tend to be more engaged with the high profile role model tennis players. And most girls that I'm involved with are not that interested in in, in, in that level. They, they don't really watch it on television. They're more interested in what they're doing, whereas the boys come and tell you everything about what's going on at the top of the men's game. So, I'd, you know, at, at the level that I work at, I don't really see that, to be honest. Um, in, ter in terms of, like, role models, it's interesting what Naomi Osaka said last week. Uh, she, she, she won the Australian Open, she also won the US Open, and she just kind of sacked her coach or parted company. And she, she, she basically said that she just wanted to be surrounded by people that made her happy. And um, I, think, I think a lot of people, have, a lot of female coaches have picked up on that message and, 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 and using it to reinforce that when you work with girls in sport, that they really want to know that you care about them uh, before they before that they care what you know, that, that kind of, uh, that, that idea. So I think, um, I think kind of linked to a previous point that I made, that I think girls need role models closer to home. <clears throat> and I think a lot of the, a lot of the, the conversation today has been about barriers and things, but um, there's a lot of good stuff going on as well. And I, I was going to, um, you would probably know about it as well, Mark, but um, it, I, the, the Judy Murray Foundation works in partnership with an organisation called Peak in the east end of Glasgow, and they rolled out a project last year um, called Like a Lassie, which was kind of a play on, you know, the kind of Like a Girl campaign that you throw Like a Girl, and it's, they called it Like a Lassie, and it was tennis-specific, and they worked with schools, um, with local young people, volunteers. Um, it, was ma it was all female-led, and they went and delivered their sessions in primary schools, but also followed in, followed on the sessions of the community. I think in terms of good practice and what, what schools could do better is, is linking with the community uh, and, and, and the clubs and community linking with schools so that if you do take part in, in, a, in a sport in school, that you know where you could do it outside of school. Um, and, uh, and certainly in terms of, I've worked in, a, in a Drum Chapel High School, for example, which is in quite an area of um, of Glasgow that, that is, is, has got lots of issues with multiple deprivation. And uh, the, the PE teacher there at the time was a kind of inspirational young female role model. She was head of PE. And the girls in her school wanted to be PE teachers, you know, that, that that's how... And I, I think just to come back to that role model thing, I think, is, is, especially for girls, it seems to me that they need to be closer to home, you know, whether it's your mum or your sister or your teacher or... They, they don't have to be amazing, they just have to be engaged, you know. Um. Now, I know that Svea has got a particular interest in role models, but I'm going to park that a wee bit because I would like to probe further about the feminine characteristics and the traditional gender roles. Do you want to add anything, Reagan, before I go on back to our panel? Um, it's just it's for, like, Danielle. Like, you're speaking about swimming. Like, 
I have lots of like girlfriends that are bigger, and they don't feel comfortable swimming like because they have to like wear a bikini, but they can. It's like, do you have any comment between like that and body positivity? Um, just like to tackle. Uh, body confidence issues across schools. I feel like it needs to be uh, implemented into the curriculum that this, that that body confidence, um, body image, understanding about fat phobia, um, understanding about uh, and tackling um, body shaming within schools is should be far higher on the agenda because. Um, you know, we tackle racism and we tackle uh, hate speech of other types um, based on religious beliefs. Um, but body shaming, fat shaming is not held to the same level as um, as other types of hate speech. And I would consider, you know, an attack on someone's physical appearance is an, is an attack on their person and it should be, you know, treated in the same way. Uh, unfortunately, it's not seen like that in schools, but um, I think it should be. Um, I think a bit of a better awareness uh, in schools, and uh, that's something that needs to be pushed into the culture of the school uh, from top down. It needs to be, you know, I think that the teachers need to be educated. They live in our culture as well, and they are affected by um, fat phobia and diet culture and uh, all of this is just as, as young girls are and so I think the education doesn't just need to be for young girls, it needs to be for throughout the school um, and, uh, and also to the parents if possible because you can do with the best will in the world you can uh, overhaul a school but they'll go home and potentially the, the message just gets uh, hammered home um, one thing... Oh, sorry. Up, not, no, sorry. no, it's um, all right, just as long as you're quick. I'm just aware that, as always happens, I'm looking at the clock and thinking, oh, gosh, where's the time going? <laughs> um, can I just make a really... I want to make a really quick point. And, um, you are very well aware of, like... I, I, I'm, I'm really into role models, and I know that's coming up next, but this idea that, like, young girls are not putting themselves and visualising themselves being high level, whereas boys are, that's quite terrifying for me. And I think that's connected to when women put themselves out there, and it's happened in politics as well, uh, they get torn down. Um, and it's generally to do with their body or their clothing. Or, and uh, I think that automatically makes girls very nervous of putting themselves uh, or, or reaching for higher levels than uh, uh, you know, that boys might. Sorry. <laughs> quick comment from Anna and then fairly quick roundups on this subject from David Martin Mandy. <laughs> A bit of a more complex question, but uh, I was just very curious after what Helen said about the thin ideal changing into this very warped fit ideal. Um, and from my personal experience of, you, I used to be on a competitive athletics team, but I never particularly enjoyed the competitive aspect about sports. And I always think, it's probably different factors for everyone. So I enjoy being in nature when I exercise or I enjoy the fun aspect of sports. And for the bloggers, like, is there any kind of way that we can promote this more fun um, characteristic of sports on social media? And, is, and for the, the academics, is there any like striving in the curriculum to, to emphasize more the fun and, and collaborative aspects of sports? Okay. Less than a minute each. <laughs> David. Um, well, so there's been a fair amount of things said that have been, I could be construed as, as negative. And I think that um, picking up on what Julie said just a moment ago, I think there's an awful lot of positives uh, that you need to think about as well. Um, you may not know this, but for the first 80 years of physical education in, in the UK, from the 1880s until the 1940s, 50s, women were the leaders of the field. There's a wonderful historical book uh, um, called Women First. Um, so it's very, very important not to lose sight of the fact that progress has been made. And women, particularly women who are in relatively affluent positions in society, the opportunities to play sports that they, now that were never available when I was younger, 
So you can think of a whole range of them. Scottish international rugby team, for example, for women, could never have been imagined before. So I think this is very, very important. I think the issue for me is that people who live in less affluent backgrounds are much less likely to have benefited from that progress. And I think this is a very, very important consideration. And just finally, just to emphasise the point Julie made, um, the demographic of who the teachers and leaders are is so important. All of the research shows that physical education in most countries in the global north, the United States, Canada, the UK and so on, are white, middle class and able-bodied. And where we have a growing um, diverse population, those teachers don't necessarily speak to the children they're teaching. I know this is actually a Scottish Government um, priority, so I'll finish on that. <laughs> Thank you, David. Very quickly, please, Mark. OK, I had a lot to say. I'll try and, try and be very succinct about it. I suppose one of the things, and it's, it's an issue that affects all young people, but has a particular relevance in this context for, for girls and young women involvement in sport, is the, the concept of sort of global self-esteem, how you feel about yourself in general, not just in the context of sport. Um, what we know from the evaluation of Girls in the Move, that where uh, girls and young women had gone through that leadership skills course and had the opportunity and were supported to use that, those skills, um, their, their sense of global self-worth and self-esteem was significantly and statistically significantly greater than those that weren't. So they, they felt more confident based on their experience of, of being involved and that then had a positive byproduct of effect on the other girls and young women in the communities that were getting to see them in, in those roles. But what, what the evaluation showed was it wasn't the sport that did it. It was the development of the leadership skills. It was the development of, of their um, sense of self that the sport was the tool by which that was allowed to happen. So there's something about, as a, as a broader societal thing, and obviously being involved in, in youth work, for all young people to develop the sense of self-worth, and I, I, without having any academic uh, backing uh, up for it, but the issues around body confidence and body image, if you have a greater sense of, of self and, and belief in who you are, then some of these issues may not be as, you may not be as vulnerable to some of them. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Ma Ma uh, Mandy, does it have to be competitive? Why can't it just be fun? Well, I'll be very, very, very quick. I firstly want to answer something to Reagan very quickly. Um, gender roles being like a kind of barrier to, I think that was your question, to sport is something that came from some of the messages that I received was open plan changing rooms can be a problem. Um, because while we're going through a phase of getting to know our bodies, um, male, female, other genders, you're like sort of learning about your body as it develops and and yeah, there's a lot of issues there. So that was a barrier for gender roles that I just wanted to put out there. Um, in terms of competing and, and things like that, well, so it wasn't until I was 25 that I went to a bodybuilding competition and was like, oh my God, she looks like a superhero. I want to do that. But I hadn't seen that image of a woman looking like that until I was that age. So I think it's just more about taking, taking the fun aspect of sports that children aren't exposed to as much or, or adolescents aren't exposed to as much into community settings. So I did something very briefly last year where I went to um, certain high schools within the sort of Dundee and wider area and I just took like, I went kind of my glamorous self and I just started doing lifting workshops with the girls and actually seeing someone like me doing that, they were like, suddenly lifting or powerlifting, that's quite cool. And it's just about bringing these ideas to, to a level. But something that came up earlier, which I think is really interesting, just very quickly, is that you needn't, you needn't have to be sort of, if I had had exposure to sports when I was younger, where I wasn't having to do the thing, so I could be the score taker, or I could still participate without being the best at it, that would have been a huge thing for me. Sorry. Yeah. Over and out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mandy. Svea has been very, very patient and she wants to talk about role models. Go for it, Sphere. <laughs> um, I think we always already have kind of touched upon this. Um, my question is how do, important do you think are female role models and in, um, increasing participation? Um, and I think one example I just thought of is we don't really have them as much. Like um, even really successful like um, female football players, no one really knows about it because it's just the men that we focus on in leagues and stuff. How important do you think that is for um, increasing participation? Julie. Um, yeah. no, just to kind of pick up on that earlier point, I, I don't think that girls um, 
I think they, they do aspire to a high level, if you know what I mean, but not, not necessarily via the mechanism of a top role model in the way that boys do. Um, and I think... But I think it is really important, like thinking about something like someone like Laura Muir at the moment, you know, and but she's getting a lot of media coverage. So I think the, the, the media is a big part of that as well. Um, like women's football, I think, is getting better. I, I was thinking about women's football today because I thought I, I've started noticing it a lot more, which means that it's it definitely, you know, it's, it's, it's out there. Um, so I think it's really important. But I do think these layers of role modelling, particularly for females, and I think that's because... Uh, of of a lack of confidence, so I think you can't generalise for all girls, but I think it's the confidence issue that a bit what you're saying there, like you know, even just to take part as an observer or a helper or a volunteer, you can see it, which means that you you can think, well, I could maybe give that a try, and, and that applies to adult women as well. You know, I'm trying to engage people to take part in a, a relay race that's coming up for charity, and and really, they, oh, I just can't, there's no way I can do that, and it's a big. It's a big journey, and, and if they see people like them doing it, they're more likely to do it themselves. Um, and I think the, it's the media thing for the top female athletes and getting to know them a little bit more and more of their human side, because I think that's what girls are interested in. Uh, they want to, they, they, they don't need to look superhuman. In fact, they want to find out what the human things are about their about these sporting role models. Um, if I could quickly mention this, a thing called Fitter, <laughs> Fitter Women. It's F-I-T-R Women. And it's a brilliant uh, app that's been developed by an athlete academic um, who's based, I think it's St Mary's University in London. And um, it's all you, you basically chart your period on it, but it's very specifically for athletes or, or people that do sport. So you, it tells you what to eat, what to, what kind of training to do. And it's, it's very easy to use. It's not like a, an elite thing either. Um, but I thought, it, I thought it's, it's just kind of, it's free as an app, and I totally recommend it uh, for anyone that does sport and wants to kind of chart those things at the same time. Very quick comments uh, from Helen and then Danielle. Super quick. So uh, in terms of role models, I think one of the things that we haven't spoken much about is actually peers. So not necessarily kind of vertical role models, but we know that um, friends dropping out of sport is a big um, predictor of individuals dropping out of sport. So what you see is like cluster of girls falling out together and friendship groups falling out together. So we're actually having kind of role models within a peer group of people who are continuing to engage in sport and exercise is really important. And then just going back to Anna's point about reasons for exercise, which we didn't kind of explore that much. So we do know that people have different reasons for engaging with exercise and sport. Um, and we know that if people engage in exercise specifically for the reason of changing their physical appearance, that they're not likely to get the same um, benefits from engaging in exercise and sport. So basically they don't get the same mental health boost as taking part, and they're also less likely to stick around. So they come for a bit and they leave. Um, so actually thinking about the reasons why people are exercising is really, really important. Danielle, a quick final comment to wrap up for us, please. Um, I was on the, on the subject of role models. Um, the Strathclyde Sirens have done, uh, well, Netball Scotland have done a lot of work on uh, on role models and how beneficial that they can be, and they actually have. Um, an initiative in place to bring role models into schools and their focus is on making sure that those role models are, are as diverse as possible to uh, try and encourage all, all young girls. Um, and I was, I was going to say, oh, 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 okay, yep. <laughs> it's fine, go for it. <laughs> okay, thank you. That was a really lovely positive note to finish on. So, so thank you for that. And can I say to the panel that uh, if there is anything that comes to mind, and I'm sure it will, please uh, drop us a line because we'd be very interested in having that. I'm now going to pass to my deputy convener, Beth Clouton, to wrap up the session. Um, I'm sure everyone agrees that was amazing and there's so much for us to think about. And I feel like the theme which keeps emerging is this idea like a societal pressure for girls to fit from like institutions for girls to fit into certain sports they should be doing to their peers not fitting in with what their other peers look like. And I think what I've taken from this is that we need a person-centered approach that like recognizes the diversity in resources that girls have, the diversity in girls' bodies, the diversities and opportunities. And thank you so much for all your contributions because it's amazing. Good. Well, uh, that concludes our evidence session for today. 
And uh, thank you very, very much to all the panel. That was absolutely fascinating. And uh, thank you to all the participants. I thought they were pretty fascinating too. And I now close this session and we'll move into private session. <laughs>